One year I was looking in the basement and I saw a chamber pot. And I thought, hmm, nobody will fight me for a chamber pot. Actually, it, it didn't even matter because I wouldn't even fight for a chamber pot myself. My name is Lisette Mallet. I come from the Acadian Peninsula in northeastern New Brunswick. I have my parents' chamber pot. In 1996, my mother broke her hip and had to go um, live in a long-term facility. And my father, with his younger sister, started emptying the house. So every year after that, my mother would ask me, what do you want from the house? With five other siblings, you can be pretty sure that whatever's in the house has been spoken for. And uh, as the youngest, whatever I asked, uh, somebody would want it. Not because they wanted it, but because I wanted it. Well, when my mother got over a surprise, she told me that was the first thing they bought for their new house. My father was born uh, in 1922, and he was the second oldest. Uh, they were 14 children, although uh, two of his younger sisters had died, you know, as toddlers. And they were poor. Home and abroad, an army was growing. For not only Britain had declared war, Canada. My father was 17 when World War II broke out. And he was earning $1.75 a week. In the army, he could make $2.20 a day. So he decided to join the Navy. He made his way to Halifax but they turned him back, told him he was too young. He was a bit upset because he had spent all his money going there, and uh, that meant uh, coming back with even less than he started with. Two years later, at 19, he told my grandmother that he was enlisting in the army. She was really upset because um, you know, she didn't want to uh, have anybody go to war in the family, but she knew that the family would not survive without that kind of income. She gave him all the money she had, which was 60 cents. And him, being savvy with money, decided to walk all the way to Caraquet, which is 36 kilometers. Uh, in order to make the money as, last as long as possible. Halfway through, uh, he had to throw his shoes away because they were all worn out, and he finished bare feet. And when he got to Caracat, it was the end of the day, and uh, they slept in, uh, in the gym, and they caught the next train to Fredericton the next morning, and they arrived later that evening. So it was basically two and a half days before he had his first meal. He never told his father or his older brother what he intended to do. Uh, I think the whole family still carried the stigma of my grandfather not enlisting uh, voluntarily for World War I. Actually, when he was 22 years old and walking to the store, he was apprehended by the military police. Uh, and that was in July 1918. And basically thrown in jail and then sent to training camp. Uh, fortunately, the war ended before he had a chance to go overseas. My grandfather was from a poor family as well. 
He was a fisherman and he also had a business uh, drying uh, fish along, um, along the beach as a way to um, help uh, with his meager earnings. They didn't have any land to grow fruits and vegetables. It was an interesting living. You could tell that there would probably have been tensions uh, within the village and the kids often acted up on it. Uh, my father, for example, when he was like uh, six or seven years old on his way to school, was uh, suddenly grabbed by a gang of uh, other kids uh, from the other end of the village and they put a noose around his neck and hung him up a tree. And he wouldn't be here if it wasn't for one of the elders in the village who was just walking by and saw him uh, strung up in the tree and, uh, and he took him down. Uh, my father didn't want to explain, or maybe he didn't even know why they had done it. But he was often teased that his grandmother wore the feather. In the army, my father trained as an electrician and a mechanic. And um, he also offered to uh, join the RCME and became a linesman to, um, to lay communication lines uh, before battle. That earned him danger pay, an extra 50 cents a day. So his salary was $2.75. So when my father left for war, there were 14 people living in that house. When he came back, they were 16, plus my uncle's wife and their first child. And then my father got married in 46, and my mother came to live with them as well. Soon she got pregnant. There was no way, she said, that she was going to have that child in that crowded house. After all, it was a one-bedroom house with a curtain separating the grandparents from the rest of the family. So they moved into their first home in, um, in late spring 1947, and my brother was born in July 1947. Their only comfort was the chamber pot. I was born in the same house house in 1960. It had electricity, plumbing, and running water. My grandparents' house now was mostly emptied of children, so it was finally the right size for them. Then in 1965, old age um, security was implemented in Canada. My grandparents thought about that as incredible wealth. The first thing my grandmother did was actually write a check to my dad for $200 uh, to try to pay him back for all he contributed to the family during the war. And it was the first time also that she expressed to him that they would not have made it without him. In 1980, I came to Toronto to study. I uh, met my man, bought a house in Roncesvalles, and had two kids. Uh, life is rather comfortable. Les enfants ont aucune idée c'est quoi d'être pauvre. This is why I keep that chamber pot in our bathroom. I don't expect them to understand. After all, I only found it in my late 30s. <laughs>